Hey guys, today I am back with another archaeological dating methods video and today we're talking about thermoluminescence. Damn, that's a long word. So we're gonna be the really cool archaeologists that we all know we are and use the term that all the professionals do, TL. Archaeologists have given this dating method a very complicated name and I have yet to find a very easy to follow, easy to understand resource for this. So this is my attempt to kind of clear the waters a little bit and explain it as best as I can. So here we go. Let's start with the word thermoluminescence. It can be broken down into two separate words. Thermo meaning heat and luminescence meaning to give off light or to emit light. It essentially means that materials that have accumulated energy over a long period of time will emit light when exposed to high heat. So thermoluminescence dating is used mostly on pottery and other inorganic objects such as burnt flint. It's a very popular dating method in archaeology because it can date the one thing that we find the most on site. Pottery. We're literally drowning in pottery. That, and it can also go further back than 50,000 years ago, which is very good because carbon-14 dating only goes to about 50, 60,000 years ago. So this is much more versatile for older sites as well. Of course, the, the cincher to why this is such a great dating method is that because it is cheap. Yes, in comparison to other dating methods, this is a very affordable one to do. So it really does help if you're on a budget. Let's get into it. Thermoluminescence is another form of radioactive dating, except this time we're measuring the amount of radiation that has accumulated over time instead of the amount of radiation that's been lost, like with carbon-14. Materials like ceramics and things like that, they're all made from geological materials. And the atoms of these materials, when they're joined together, form these crystalline lattice net type structures. When the atoms in this lattice get exposed to nuclear radiation, the electrons get all hooked up on this energy and they break free from the lattice. Some electrons will then get trapped inside of the lattice deformities, which are caused by either missing atoms or impurities within the mix. This is why we call them electron traps. Of course, this isn't just a one-time thing. Over time, more radiation is gonna be absorbed into the object and more electrons are gonna break free and get trapped inside of this latticework. If the absorption of radiation happens at a constant rate, something that we call the annual dose, then the electrons will accumulate uniformly over time. The size of the population of these electrons can then be measured and directly related to the amount of radiation that the object has been subjected to over time. This is what we call the total dose. This, of course, directly relates to the total time that an object has been subjected to radiation, and we can calculate it, in theory, with a simple equation. This equation, age equals the total dose divided by the annual dose. The elements that we get the annual dose from are uranium, thorium, and the radioactive isotope of potassium, which is potassium-40. These isotopes emit all the things. We're talking alpha particles, beta particles, and even gamma rays. Yeah, the stuff superheroes are made out of. Oh, psh, thorium, now I get it. Oh, I'm not a Marvel person. Alpha and beta particles can't penetrate the surface of an object very well though, and they can't give us a proper reading of the date. So what we really need to look at are the gamma rays, because gamma rays can penetrate about 20 centimeters into an object's surface, which is excellent news for us. These three isotopes have super long half-lives and their emissions are assumed to be at a constant rate, which is not like the carbon-14, which can kind of fluctuate over time. This makes it really easy to measure the annual dose part of the equation just by looking at emission levels today. Now we need to get to the total dose, which is done by measuring the trapped electrons inside of the object. This is where thermoluminescence comes in. When pottery and other ceramic objects are made, they're fired, which means that they are exposed to very, very high heat. This makes them stronger, more durable. The heat that's needed for this though also serves a purpose for those electrons that are trapped inside of the lattice. The heat provides the electrons with the energy needed to break free from their very sad prisons. Freedom! This means that the electron count gets set back to zero and the accumulation process begins all over again. So if the pot was fired once and then just used for cold storage or any other sort of circumstance that did not bring it 
into uh, an area where there was high heat. When we would date this object, we would actually get the date of when it was made, when it was produced. But if the pot was used for cooking or other sorts of, uh, again, activities that used high heat, the electron count would have then been reset every time that it was exposed to heat, which means when we date an object like this, like a cooking vessel or something like that, we actually get the date of the last time that it was heated, maybe used. This method of heating and releasing electrons from their traps is how thermoluminescence works. We reset the clock to find out how long it's been running for. First, you shave away the first few millimeters of the pottery or the sample that you're gonna be testing to get rid of all those alpha and beta particles because they're not gonna give you the right information, they're gonna give you some false information. We wanna get to the gamma rays. Then the material is heated to about 500 degrees Celsius or higher in a lab setting, in a very controlled setting. What happens is the energy that's lost from the electrons as they make their great escape gets emitted as light radiation. This luminescence is then measured and is directly proportional to the amount of electrons that were trapped inside before it was heated. And this gives us the total radiation dose. Ta-da! You then plug in all of those numbers into the equation and you get your age. Now, of course, you can't just sample one specimen or object and assume that it's the date for the entire site. You usually have to do other things that are very vital, like taking sample soils and dating those as well to make sure that the radiation matches the object that you pulled out of the ground. You also need to measure multiple samples to make sure that your calculations and everything was correct. This is just proper science, guys. The precision of this dating method is plus or minus 10%, which is very, very good. But of course, if you're dating some very, very old pottery, you're gonna get a larger margin of error. Let's not forget that once you heat that object, once you heat that sample or that specimen, its clock gets reset back to zero. So you can't really use it for further testing and it can't be properly dated anymore. This can cause a lot of problems when you're identifying the authenticity of objects. I've heard some stories of people in China using CAT scans and x-ray machines to actually put in more radiation into their objects so that way when it's dated, it actually, actually dates from a time, like a, a much older time, which is very sneaky, I must say. It's very smart. I wouldn't have thought about doing that, but uh, don't do that. Just this is what happens. This is the reality of what I'm telling you. As a conservator, I also have to note that this method is damaging to the object, right? It's destructive. It's a destructive, invasive process. You have to take a sample, you have to shave it away. So you also have to think about the ethics for this. You have to make sure that this object is the only object that you can take this sample from. You need to make sure that it's worth interfering with the object to get this date. That being said, pottery is super abundant in archaeological sites, so I'm sure there's going to be one or two pieces that are not very diagnostic that you're able to take samples from. So that's it. Hopefully a simple explanation for a complicated word. If you want a full write-up with some other resources and things like that, there is a link to my website in the description below, so go ahead and click that. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel. I want to say a huge thank you to all of my patrons on Patreon. If you want to support the channel as well, you can go ahead and click the link back down in my description to get some really cool behind the scenes access, free things, stuff like that. Here are all of my socials, and as always, Stay dirty, my friends.